Anyway, so I'll, I'll start. This is the former Fitzboff. I think we're always going to call it the Fitzboff, um, even though uh, we're not going to talk about just Fitz anymore. Um, I'm hoping Lucio will sign on. I haven't seen him yet. Uh, I have, so we're going to go through, I'll just do a general introduction. We're now open to any kind of data format that is somewhat standard in astronomy, which includes planetary astronomy and um, planetary exploration in general. Now, we're going to be more specific about that. We've discussed PDS in the past, but this time we'll have a couple of talks about it. Um, parquet, which is a, I assume it's parquet pronounced that way, um, is the, is a, um, catalog format that's being standardized. And there's actually been some action on FITS, or at least some discussion, which is usually what happens with FITS for a long time before there is actually action. And Lucio has a couple of slides. And I'm hoping he was going to be able to sign in. I think I've got him. Okay, now I don't see him. He was around. Uh, there he is. Oh, he didn't get updated. Just a minute. I can check for people that wants to join. They just have to yeah. raise their hand. Yeah, okay, no, he should be in now. He only has audio, so um, I think he should be here. Can you hear me, Lucio? You can, um, oh, you might have him. Oops, I just lost him. Try again here. Uh, okay. Oh, that time I lost him totally. Um, well, he has, we have slides for him. I can maybe move the slide order around if, if he doesn't show up. Um, he was an attendee, then I upgraded him to panelist, and then he disappeared. Couldn't take the pressure. Yeah, I don't know. Um, he'll be back. So Lucio is effectively the, the chair of the FITS special expert group under the IAU um, working group on astronomical data, data representation, which I ended up being chair of because nobody else wanted to be chair. Um, so we haven't really done much except host these every year. Rose has helped me out um, some and uh, she's gonna, take notes and keep track of what's going on. And I have actually everybody's presentation. I didn't put all of Rob's on, so I'll switch to him um, when we get to him. And so this is the basic thing. We're gonna talk about everything and try to figure out how we can make all the different formats work together. Um, and a lot of what we do with FITS is try to be archival, but at the same time, archival in a way that anything that has ever been fits is still fits. That's once fits, always fits, which is our basic thing, which means we have to be careful about making changes and they all have to be backward compatible. Sort of like Windows versus Macs, which means if you make changes, you can't break stuff. And that's why things get hard and why things don't change fast enough for a lot of people. Um, I've been doing this for 45 years which it seems like a long time. I can't believe I've been doing it for that long, but um, here we go. So, oops, I just lost. There we go, that was what I wanted to do next. Well, if we don't have Lucio, I'll do this. What first. happens, sorry, Jessica, what often happens if you promote somebody to be on the panelist uh -huh. Your current Zoom dies, and a new one should automatically come up. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe he has to log in again, and then he will, because it then remembers that he's a panelist, and he should be able to come in. Okay. Oh, I can allow him to talk. Oh, it's not available. He's using an older version of Zoom. Okay, so I'll promote him to panelist again. Okay. Now he's being promoted to panelist. Zoom should reboot now. And I don't get his microphone. That's what's sort of weird when he gets promoted. So that means maybe, oh, and there he went away. I'm wondering if every oh. time I promote him, he goes away and then I can't, he doesn't come back. 
Yeah, when he comes back, it should come back in panelist mode. But we'll we'll Let's see, see if it does. He showed up on the panelist chart and then he disappeared. But then he didn't come back last time. He came back as an attendee. Um, so I think I think that people get confused and don't wait enough, and they kill Zoom when. Yeah, you know, and then restart Zoom and just don't let it. Yeah, that could be it. Okay. Um, let's see. He's back. Um, no, he's not back. Somebody else joined. Okay. Um, let's see if it shows back. It keeps moving around, but I haven't figured out what it does. Okay. So what I'll do, but not having him here yet, is. Um, when I turn, I don't know how this happened, but I got um, Anne first. But we'll start with PDS with Anne, because she's here. All right. I am and, indeed. And um, I have your screen as part of my. So I have what I did is I put everything into one PDF file so we can have a PDF for the Why? save a PDF. And yep. I have both of your slides, Anne, but I don't have all of okay. your. We'll start with Anne, and you can go forward. Just tell me when to switch. All righty. Uh, I just want to give you a quick, like five minute overview of what PDS, the new PDS4 format is. So this is two simple slides. First thing to remember is that PDS is defining its own format only for observational data products, the, the very core of our archive. Although we define observational data um, rather broadly. So it includes higher level uh, products like shape models and uh, maps and things like that. Other products like documentation in particular, we're looking at audio and video now that's being returned by uh, some of these missions. Other products need to be in formats that have a formal and preferably internationally adopted and supported standard and that we can reasonably expect to have longevity comparable to the data in the archive, which is 50 to 100 years. We're a long-term archive and we cannot be doing format migration on increasing petabytes of data every 20 years as paradigms change. So when we look to external formats, we're looking to things like the MPEG standards for audio and video. We're looking at PDFA for document standards and things like that. So given that background, next slide, please. Uh, the PDS observational data format is designed specifically for preservation and nothing else. It is software and hardware agnostic as far as that is possible. We tell you what the standard format is for the organization of the bits, the byte order, everything that we think you need to know to read the data. There are dead, simple, logical formats for storing data, so it is very hard to misread. And when it is misread for whatever reason, either programming error or because it turns out the structural metadata was wrong and nobody noticed, when it is misread, misread it tends to have a diagnostic pattern that tells you what went wrong. So if you're reading an image and the byte order is wrong in the label or wrong in your code, there's a distinctive pattern to byte swapped data. You look at it and you think, oh, it's byte swapped. You change one thing and the data pops out. There's very little that can go wrong. Uh, and the PDS metadata is designed for discovery and reuse. So it is exhaustive as far as we could imagine that and we keep building on it. It is standardized, so we have the core metadata for things like provenance and high level discoverability that is the same across every data source in the archive. And uh, then down to the discipline level, so imaging keywords, spectroscopy keywords, geometry keywords, these are all being standardized so that every mission is using the same concepts in the same way. And it's extensible so that as new disciplines develop, as new data types are incorporated into the PDS, as new missions come along, things can be described in the amount of detail that it takes so that users who have nothing to do with the original data and no access to the original team will be able to use the data 20 years from now. The data will be there for people who have not been born yet to do science with. And if you really care about this stuff, and of course everyone does, I'm sure. Um, I gave a presentation on the history of the development of the PDS-4 standards, including some formative experiences that were very much in our minds as we redesigned the PDS-4 metadata standards. 
at the Open Planetary Virtual Conference, which was held this summer. And it is still online, of course, in YouTube. Um, make some popcorn, get yourself a beer. It's 45 minutes plus questions. And that's basically it. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's PDS4 in a nutshell. Um, yeah, okay. This is a good one for you, Rosa, if you can handle questions. Okay. I could bring the Discord server up in my other window. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, good. Yeah, you can look and see if there's anything. There's been, people should know there's been a pretty rigorous discussion of um, all sorts of data representation in the Discord server for this BOF. So it's a useful place to look. Um, since it's hard to have an in-room discussion like we usually do, Discord has taken its place. I, I think, think that's good. The okay, question but, is about HDF5 initiative if, if the people are asking and we're aware so you can say more about that okay um yeah we're aware there's something going on and there's also asdf um which is um sort of a nasa based um large telescope lsst and JWST initiative for a new data format that's somewhat HDF5-like. Um, there's a talk tomorrow on that in the um, um, afternoon session, which is my morning session. So I'll get up early for that um, by Perry Greenfield from um, Space Science Telescope Institute. So, um, and I don't have anybody talking from about HDF5, but if someone wants to sort of talk about the state of HDF5, we will go to that after we finish with PDS or with the stuff that's on the agenda right now. Um, so I've been sort of keeping an eye out for Lucio and he keeps not showing up. So. Uh, he says to use the recorded presentation. Okay, I've got it. So I have the, um, oh, did he actually send? Let me see if I can find what I've got from him. Um, I'm going to stop, stop share for right now. I'm going to stop sharing for now. Um, stop sharing. Stop. Okay, I'm back. Um, so why don't we, I'm going to look and see what I've got from him. So why don't we go on with your discussion, Rob? And okay. Keep it fairly brief, but you can share your screen. All right. Hit the wrong button. <laughs> Do you see that? Yep, I see a bunch of stuff. And how about now? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Cool. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking about not one, but two XML standards. And I thought I'd make it a little more exciting and make it about planetary defense instead of planetary science. It's exactly the same talk. If you find an asteroid for defense, you're also finding it for science. Um, in case anybody's been wondering where I've been for the last five years, I've moved over to the Catalina Sky Survey, which is literally right next door to NOAO. Uh, so uh, basically the theme of this is standards in the real world. Um, standards like these XML standards, PDS4 and 80s, I'll talk about 80s a little bit, are frequently mandated for, for projects. Uh, there's nobody in the FITS community who doesn't understand that arguing about standards wastes time. Uh, as both uh, Jessica and Anne have just said, standards are long lived. They live longer than human careers. And uh, you basically have to decide, I'm going to embrace this standard whether or not I have an opinion about it. Uh, they require judgment and usage. Uh, many, most, not quite all features must be rigorously obeyed, but others, there's certainly many examples in FITS 
you need to sort of just casu casually reject the the, the standard. Um, this is more uh, bait for, for Anne to have an opinion after the talk. Uh, projects use multiple standards and multiple standards interact in many ways. So uh, like I said, it's hard to make XML exciting. Raise your hand if you see the asteroid in this picture. I, I, tell me, Jessica, when somebody has raised their hand because I can't okay. see the... Um, okay, somebody has ahead. seen it. Sorry, somebody has seen it, yeah. I think Anne has seen this slide before, so that's cheating, but there you go. It's in the circle. This is a very high signal to noise detection, folks should know. Normally you're looking at things that look more like the noise in the background. All right, this is 10 hours later back on Earth. Tell me when you see the asteroid. <laughs> Uh, that was about a one kiloton explosion, which is about the size of a, of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, so there are real world implications to XML standards is kind of what I'm getting at. Okay, so the idea for the Catalina Sky Survey is to convert pixels into threat assessments and ultimately to be able to do something about the threats to protect planet Earth. So NASA has been tasked by the Congress to find near earth asteroids. And to do that, it's formed something called the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, uh, which funds NEO surveys, including Catalina Sky Survey. Catalina Sky Survey, which is the big green bar in the, in the uh, figure at the bottom of the slide, uh, has been one of the most successful of those. And uh, I don't know if it's comforting, but this has been yet another record setting year even given all that's been going on in 2020, or maybe because of all the stuff that's been going on in 2020. On the right-hand side of this slide is a portion, about a third of our workflow. The items in the green boxes are data uh, formats, uh, files that will be, uh, they're currently now being sent to the Planetary Science Institute uh, for archiving uh, using PDS4 standards. Uh, so just to give one little picture, Anne already covered some of this, uh, the NASA planetary data, science, uh, planetary data system uh, is divided into nodes, including the small bodies node, which is the one we interact with, which has uh, three sub nodes, at least three, at the University of Maryland, at the Planetary Science Institute, which is about uh, 300 yards away from where I'm sitting now and the Minor Planet Center, which is close to where Jessica is. Uh, the, as far as standards, the Small Bodies Node inherits a requirement from PDS to support PDS4. Uh, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office funds both the Minor Planet Center and something called the Center for NEO Studies, which is at JPL. I'm just giving you all this because standards have a lot of weight behind them. And uh, CMEOS and MPC have defined the ADES standard, which is another XML standard uh, that has been blessed by the IAU. And uh, so PDS4 and ADES are mandated for Catalina Sky Survey to use if we want to interact with PDS and with MPC, which NASA tells us we do. So uh, Standards are defined, standards are inherited, standards are mandated, and uh, our opinions about standards are not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, this is the old standard for submitting astrometry and is what was used to submit the astrometry for that asteroid that was discovered uh, in the previous slides. Uh, and this is a so-called 80 column format. The four records at the bottom are 80 columns. The ones at the top are, are these header records are actually not 80 columns, they're uh, random length records. Uh, I should say that NASA also requires uh, the uh, people they fund to archive our software. So there's all another level of interaction there. Uh, CSS creates lots of files. You saw some of them before. Here's a half dozen of them. The ones in red are basically, uh, uh, equivalent to each other. You, so there's that 80 column format. There's a FITS binary table, FITS lives on. And that's what I've been working on during the pandemic is FITS binary tables. And then that gets turned into the 80s format. 
Uh, so Fitz binaries tables are concise and you have a lot of tools. 80s is verbose. So those 13 lines of the 80 column format turn into about 300 lines. And the incidental discoveries, uh, so the NEO surveys discover the same asteroids over and over and over again, night after night. The incidental 80s file for a busy night at our premier telescope is several million lines. Uh, so this is what 80s looks like. It looks like XML. I won't talk much about the XML. You'll see that it's not very XML. Uh, it doesn't embrace the XML nature of it. When you see the PDS uh, example later, you'll see that it looks much more like a programmer would recognize as XML. Uh, in that is some astrometric data. The, the things highlighted in yellow are approximately equivalent to the to the 80 column format before. Uh, it, it does allow you to include internal fields that get stripped off before it's submitted. And that includes from FITS, which I've highlighted. So all these standards work together. Uh, 80s is XML. You can use tools like X, uh, like X style sheets to make a CSV file, and then you can import into XML. Here's a couple of plots that I just dumped out of, out of a big incidental file. To give you a sense, uh, this was not a busy night, this particular example. Those are all the main belt asteroids where they fell on our CCD. There are a lot of asteroids out there. And here are the near Earth asteroids. This happens to be a different night. Uh, the uncertainty versus the magnitude plot uh, overlaid on the main belt asteroids. And it, mostly we're seeing that they behave similarly. So PDS4 is also XML. Um, each file archived with PDS needs a label. On uh, Halloween last year, uh, Catalina uh, created 40,000 files. So that's 40,000 labels. So that's sort of the effort needed to um, archive in PDS is, is to create those labels. So uh, the requirements are to create the labels. It supports various file types, as Anne said. Uh, fits uh, images, fits binary tables, text tables, various documents. Um, there's a conversation at the moment on relaxing a carriage return line feed requirement for text files. And we definitely support relaxing that uh, since we're all our computers are Linux computers, of course. Uh, and uh, part of this effort uh, in, in cooperation with uh, PSI and, and the other LPL uh, NEO survey Space Watch has been to create a schema for ground-based NEO surveys. So our labels agree with that, with that schema. Uh, so you create documentation and you have a peer review. Um, the uh, Catalina project is a real-time archival project. So that's something different that we're introducing or, or emphasizing in PDS4. Uh, so here, the rest of the slides just look like a bunch of XML. Uh, so here are the PDS4 labels. You uh, note, programmers will note that it looks a lot more like XML with, with uh, schema locations and namespaces. Uh, PDS4 uses Schematron, which if, you, if you're shaking your, shaking your fist at XML schema, I, I recommend you take a look at Schematron, which is a pretty good way of conveying business rules for your project uh, onto the resulting XML. Uh, and then I just have 10 slides with a bunch of things. It, uh, PDS4 uses URNs, very similar to the, to the IVOA URNs. Uh, uh, Anne mentioned that it, it, the attempt is to get a lot of metadata on each data product. And that includes all the way from the top. What was the point of this, the point of this? particular data product was to do science and we're doing different sorts of investigations uh, through a description of the observing sy system and the target. This particular file contains astrometry from multiple asteroids. Uh, and then it, it describes the survey to some extent uh, and it, uh, we're including things like the limiting magnitude. So Catalina Sky Survey computes a limiting magnitude for every single image because the image can includes main belt asteroids and we know how bright they are from the catalog. 
uh, and then it includes information about the software. Uh, it includes, this is a Fitch binary table. So it starts to break out what the binary table looks like. Uh, and it does that in quite a bit of detail. So it's an interesting exercise to construct XML that describes what a, what a Fitch file looks like. So it knows that the offset is this 31680 multiple of 2880 that old Fitz hands will recognize as one of those multiples. It's a table with 63 records, et cetera. Uh, and it breaks out into the individual columns. So there's this something in the Neo community called the Digest 2 algorithm. And, and this is how you put this in a, in a PDS4 label describing a Fitz binary table. Uh, so to make use of 80s, to go back to that for a moment, um, it's, it's archive projects. So it's about preserving data and organizing data. And in particular for 80s, it's about understanding data. So those uh, two, two plots I showed of the XY and the RMS and uh, magnitude plots uh, were very easy to dump out of the 80s. And then for PDS, it's about using the data and those half dozen bullets at the bottom are about different projects that we hope to wire into the PDS. Uh, some of these are ongoing, some are in the future. We have a crowdsourcing project, we have a pre-recovery project, and we're supporting uh, uh, projects like the Catalina Real-Time Survey used to be. There's one called Sawaro, which is a LIGO follow-up project. So all of these standards work together. And uh, to sum up, uh, use cases drive standards. It should not be the other way around. And uh, any questions and comments, rants and uh, objections are, would be welcome. Okay. And I will stop sharing my screen unless anybody wants, I can't see the questions, so. Okay. Yeah, why don't you stop sharing your screen and we'll go back. If I may, add, just apropos of your final slide, um, one of the projects we're currently working on at the Maryland half of the small bodies node is um, developing a geometry dictionary specifically to hold the FITS world coordinate system parameters that so that they is, can be mapped directly into a label structure. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one. Th I mean, I could have talked for another couple of hours here. There, there are oh, things sure. that still need to be done. But on the other hand, PDS makes it easy to get to the FITS object that contains the world coordinates. So users do have near direct access to the world coordinates should they need it. OK. OK, with that, are there questions from the audience about PDS4? Um, so on the, I've been looking for somebody to talk about H. DF5, and it looks like we're sort of at the permanent state that we always are at HDF5 as people are looking at it, and there's not really any standardization yet. And if anybody knows if there is, um, you can comment in the um, Discord discussion. And going on, I'll give Lucio's presentation um, and I'll share my screen. And bing. Okay, and then share. Okay, people see this inputs for data format, Boff? Yes. Good, okay, here we go. So um, we're moving to the last several years because Lucio hasn't been at one of these since um, we were in Trieste. Um, so he's gonna keep zipping through though. So um, there's a version for a draft that has all been approved, it's online, um, but there's still things that haven't totally happened yet. Time WCS and continue and other things like that. So um, this you do not know. So that <laughs> there's work that going on in the FITS working group, which had, if people know about FITS, the FITS working group moves very slowly, but when it moves, it's decisively. That's how I look at it. Um, there's a technical panel for long keyword names, which is the thing we really want. It got put on moratorium, then got put on moratorium. And then IAU reorganized in the course of that time. 
and FITS Working Group became the FITS Special Extra Group that was underneath the Astronomical Data Representation Working Group. And, um, but they're sort of coming back now. And this one, um, let's see, I'm looking at this twice. Um, anyway, there's, uh, things are happening. So there is long work, long keyword name work going on. They're looking at metadata as a file extension. And then they're looking at approving the World Coordinate System Convention's um, distortion and which I'm not sure if anybody actually uses it, but people can comment if they do. Um, and other projections which are sort of in the works or have been used. Um, Mark Helbrand has said they're informal. I incorporate all these things, maybe not YPD. PNX, APX, and SIP are included in WCS tools though, or at least deciphering them. Um, and so there's, this is a FITS working group opinion. Um, has FITS a non-frozen future? Uh, maybe. Um, people like the idea of longer keyword names. And it gets tricky, I think, especially in the table format to implement it. Other than that, it's straight, fairly straightforward, I think. Um, and so people- Why do you say it's hard to implement in a table format? Tables, because it, it has a bunch of side effects of allowing larger tables and things like that that might be limited by- Well, well the last time I, I interacted with the uh, fits technical group. Um, I was advocating that we just move the headers into a binary table, in which case you can define the columns to be anything you want. Right, that's true. So we'll see. Um, and then, but of course, old timers, there are fewer and fewer old timers. So this is how things change in general in life is when there are fewer and fewer. Um, well, I don't know about that. I mean, as I said, I've been working on FITS binary tables all year now. Um, it's legal FITS already to put your headers in a binary table. Right. I know. It's just more complicated. Um, you can do things like that. That's always been legal. But, and then you can put more information in. But then when you have to read it, it is backward compatible with old readers. Anyway, I just say it's a whole thing. To, it's a whole new implementation thing, even though it's legal because using the header then becomes more complicated, depending on what you're trying to do with it. Um, I guess I'm an old timer. I count. I wrote my first Fitz reader in the, about 1980. So, um, which didn't used to be, make me an old timer, but it does now. Um, and so the long name, long keyword name, there actually is a switch in, um, in CFITS.io, which turns on long keyword names. And uh, so I think we're moving toward that, although there's been a lot of discussion against it and for it, like the classic old timer discussion, but it's being pushed up from the community, which means us, that it happened. Um, and I don't know about record value keywords exactly. Um, Shall we, ex oh, and then there's a discussion about an expanded char character set that allows lowercase blanks and some special characters. Um, and I think people are wary about becoming case sensitive after being case insensitive for a long time. It makes things more readable to use lowercase, but if you have a, a larger keyword length, it, it'll still be readable. And sometimes it's, useful to stick to a single kind of character. Um, a higher arc has to be maintained, but you can really include that if you allow blanks. Um, and, uh, okay, so anyway, so it's interesting. I hadn't known that he has prototypes in IDL and Java, and I know Bill has stuff in CFITS.io. So, um, which he might talk about in his, award talk later in this. So that's sort of where we are with FITS right now. Um, does anybody have any FITS questions? 
I have a fifth, this is Rob again, I have a fifth comment that uh, the uh, various IAU commissions received something from the IAU mo mothership telling us that there, uh, there's some level of reorganization going on yet again. Um, and if uh, the Fitz community is interested in continuing on, you might want to touch in yeah. with uh, Commission D2. Right. Yeah, I think we will. I think this is a thing about bureaucracies that they have to reorganize a little more frequently than they need to, like way more frequently than they need to. Um, well, it's been six years, you know. Right. Yeah, right. To, to, what, what? That's a couple of pandemics ago by this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so everything's moved slowly during the pandemic year, even though theoretically people have time. Somehow they don't have focus. That's my, that's how I work anyway. I have time, but no focus and, um, or too many focuses. And one of them is always health. And one is what I can do and can't do. And one is working from home is weird. Um, but now, I, now that I do it, I want to keep doing it after the pandemic. Not all the time, but more often than I have in the past. Because um, I have a better computer set up at home. I can't do Zoom from my office very well because I have a Linux workstation with no camera or microphone. And, and just friend, forgot. Yeah. James. Oh, I forgot your last name. Someone wants to talk. OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. I'm sure. one of the H5Pi developers, oh, so nice. I can't really talk too much about HDF5 in astronomy because the HDF5 stuff I've done mm -hmm. was very bespoke, so that was for a theoretical um, setup. Um, but I know uh, XFEL, so that's the synchrotron uh, or like conglomeration across Europe. Uh -huh. They've come up with their own sort of metaformant on top of HDF5. Um, there's actually another ASDF, um, which is from uh, seismology, which also builds on top of uh, HDF5. So I think, and I know I, like last year, I was chatting with a few people at CSIRO um, in Australia about they were coming up with some radio astronomy format using HDF5 also. Um, so I think there's like, uh, things around that are flooding like that you could use but I think yeah, it's it's really picking a thing that astronomers want to use okay and that that I think is the what needs would need to be done for HDF5 okay. so the HDF group actually quite recently moved all of their stuff on the github uh -huh. so they're a lot more open now than they have been previously um and as one of the H5 Pi developers like we, the H5 Pi developers have sort of been pushing them to make as much of the stuff they do and the sort of the development process as open as possible. Um, so that's sort of changing. Oh, that's good. That's, that's sort of the recent changes that's been happening. Yeah, so now we need to work on, the problem with HDF5 is it's like infinite in possibility. And yeah. what you really need that's... to do within a discipline is restrict the possibility so that you can implement it. Yeah, so the there are other readers besides the main uh, core library. So H5Pi wraps the main uh -huh. HDF library, which is part of the problem is the library is also in the same thing. Um, but there is a pure Python reader, and I think there is someone working on Rust reader writer. But there is the there's this weird coupling between there's the format, there's the library, and then extensions to the library such as the compression and all that, that's sort of defined at the library level. And then there's the meta formats on top of that. And so you have these three different layers. And right. with the HDF5, you sort of have to define which layer you're talking about. Uh -huh. so that can, can that does sort of muddy the conversation a bit. It's, it's worth looking at the astronomical use cases and that a, a good way to do that might be to look at the FITS conventions that that reality forced on a FITS standard many years after FITS was in, imagined. Um, and in particular, having been associated with it, um, what I've seen that's been a few years since I've looked about HDF5 compression is rather naive compared to the FITS tile compression, which has a couple of papers in PASP you might look into if compression comes up. 
there's a lot of different compression algorithms. So um, it's actually quite extensible. So uh, the Celix um, group has been pushing a bunch of different compression algorithms through the system. And I know PyTables, which doesn't sit on top of H5Py, um, has a whole bunch of specialist stuff there. Okay. So anybody else with questions? Is there anything on um, Discord? There's a, a conversation going on over there. Okay, we'll leave the conversation then. Um, why don't we move on to David and um, parquet, the parquet format? And um, let's see if I can figure out how to get myself up here. Um, okay, screen share. Oh, do I just need to start talking? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just, is, is my screen shared? Yeah, it is, yes. Okay, good. Yes, so I, I can control that. Oh, okay, there it great. is. I found out where it is. Okay, yeah, now you're set. Okay, you can go. Great, thank Just you. Just start talking. Yes, hello, everyone. I just have two slides on Parquet, which is one of these newer formats coming out of uh, big data, the Hadoop ecosystem. It, it, it did come out around 2013, so it's been around for a while. Parquet is a column-based format, so things are stored in columns. It does, by default, come compressed uh, along columns. And it also will handle uh, variable length data like light curves. So you can have a column of uh, your magnitudes that uh, vary in length because, because you know you have non-detections. You have detections and non-detections for light curves and, and variable coverage, but you can make an entire table out of that. It is highly parallelizable when you partition the data if you use uh, frameworks like Spark or Dask. And I think many of you saw the talk on Pangeo right before this one. I'm, I'm really glad that I woke up early to catch that. The, uh, the Gaia part of that was using this Parquet format. Uh, it's it's cloud friendly. It supports object storage, and and what's important for a cloud application is it's subsettable in place. So you can just say I just want some specific columns out of it, and you can do simple filtering by row, rows, like equalities and inequalities. Uh, it works well with uh, the popular pandas package. Uh, I have to confess I'm a I'm a Python person, so I'm doing Python all the time. But from what I've heard, there's there's good support in languages besides Python um, through the Arrow project. Um, yeah, I see there's, OK, yes, yeah, so I'll go through the applications, and I guess we'll get to the questions. Some examples of Parquet applications, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory catalogs are going to be made available in Parquet format. Uh, related to that are the simulations from the LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration in Parquet. Uh, so there's a preprint from just a couple of weeks ago from them. Um, I know that they were putting out their, their first version of their, uh, their Cosmo Sims uh, data challenge to in, in HDF5 format because we're, we're going to serve that. We're, we're in the process of serving that from uh, the URSA archive at IPAC. But their, their paper and I, their newer versions are going to be in Parquet. So they're, they're switching over there. Uh, Parquet underlies the astronomy extensions for Spark, which is something that Mario Jurek and company presented at last year's ADAS. Um, there's an astronomical journal paper um, which you can look up for that. So at URSA, we're, we're uh, exploring Parquet for bulk distribution of large catalogs. I have a poster on the work that we're doing with the NeoWise table, which is a 114 billion row table, uh, which, which says a little bit about um, our experiences uh, working with this format. The, the, and the 
as in something very interesting that I found was um, from the recent Scientific Python 2020 conference that was held in July. There was a talk by a, a, an earth sciences person on uh, treating, well, the, treating the gridded geospatial data as point data to simplify analytics. Uh, so it was interesting in a couple of aspects because they were uh, converting uh, imaging data that they had in HDF5 format to Parquet as a tabular format. Um, and and uh, the talk is interesting because ex they explain the reasons why they moved from HDF5 to Parquet. And some of that had to do with um, these, these cloud ready capabilities. So um, I guess people can, I, I, I realize you can't click on these links, but you could Google that and and look at it. And um, yes, no you doubt will be able be to, more. This will all be saved and the link should be clickable then. Okay. Um, I, I'm hoping that will all happen because um, 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 Anne's link, work, link was clickable too. So I tested that. So I haven't tested these yet, but I'll try it. Make sure that they're clickable when I submit it. Okay. Um, so, so I've been following some of the discussion in the Discord channel. So, so I think the challenges with these, with 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 these big formats, when there's a lot of data, because if serving all the NeoWise data, something like 23 terabytes, and um, is 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 how you have an ancillary file that's maybe an XML or or uh, or YAML or something, which, which is what ASDEF does. And that describes what's what's in the catalog. So um, yeah, so I say I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this from the standpoint of uh, an archive that's looking at serving this as a, as a bulk format, as an alternative to what we how we serve these bulk catalogs now for people who want the whole thing is, is a pipe separated you know, it's like a comma separated file that's that's compressed with bzip2. Um, okay. okay, that that was the end of the slide. So I, I see yeah. there's one question in the Q and A. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can't see Q and A, so answer it. You can read it and answer it. Oh, or... okay. So I will I will answer it live. Uh, so the question from Simon Perkins is: Can one do updates and appends with Parquet. Um, I, I believe the answer is yes. So I'm working with these astronomy extensions for Spark. We're running it at IPAC, and they do have an append function. So I, I am pretty sure the answer is yes. Although I, in, in my own work that I've done so far, I've just been kind of making the whole catalog all at once. OK. Andreas Vesenek has a question, too. I think he's unmuted, so he can ask it. Yeah, OK. Thanks, David. That this uh, was a good overview. Uh, so we are, we are just working, actually, uh, one of my students working on a, a way to, um, well, put the uh, HGF, oh, sorry, fit, fit very big fit cubes into Parquet and uh, do queries on top of that. Um, and that's quite interesting, actually, um, of, uh, because, well, you can do it in parallel, obviously. So do things um, on a cluster in parallel, which is uh, quite uh, something if you have many, many objects in there and want to do subcubes or something like that. So pretty good uh, experience, um, but uh, in some other cases, it's not that as, as well tuned. Uh, the other thing is um, because then you, you are actually on a cluster and, and the whole infrastructure gets quite complex including the uh, um, the underlying um, distributed storage system. Uh, so, so tuning all of that is actually quite some, some work and getting it working in, in a seamless way. What's your experience in that? Yes, uh, that is a great observation about the tuning of the, the cluster. <laughs> and um, I realize that we have a little bit of a problem with our setup at IPAC because we uh, we have a research cluster, but it's not really tuned for performance op optimization. So 
when we when when we're running some of these axis commands to like make a two D histogram of of Gaia, which is something that was showed in that Pangeo talk, um, it's taking us twenty minutes to do it, and in in the uh, the University of Dirac, I'm sorry, University of Washington Dirac Institute, they have a couple of deployments, and it takes about a minute. So I think that's because we our, our disk storage is slow, um, and I have been struggling a lot with the uh, with the tuning of of the spark underlying that. So uh, yes, I I I agree with you uh, definitely that the tuning is 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 somewhat difficult, and the Dirac Institute has the advantage that they have a they have somebody who's a spark expert there in Seattle who works for, for the Databricks company. Um, that is helping them out. Um, yes, so that that's definitely a concern. Yeah. So if it, if you want to go that direction, uh, you need to have a specialist. We, we, when we started, that uh, although the, the guy was actually is, is really good <laughs> in all kinds of things, but uh, but it took him quite some time to get it working in a in a decent um, well, setup, um, and that includes already the partitioning and all of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a pretty steep learn learning curve. And if something goes wrong, it's not quite clear where it's going wrong and so on. But on the other side, of course, it's enabling things which you can't do any in, with any other technology, uh, at least not very straightforward um, without a lot of uh, self-implementation of things. So this is prob probably the only thing you can do more or less straight out of the box with the whole stack on top of it including the um, the reduction of, of data. Um, so, so yeah, it's plugging into all kinds of frameworks. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of um, ecosystem around it, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely, definitely a lot uh, around it. And, uh, you know, people in other fields outside of astronomy working with it. So that's an advantage. Um, um, I just promoted Perry up. Do you want to, Perry Greenfield? Do you want to talk about um, ASD, ASDF a bit? And uh, just before, uh, there is a question: How oh, is it, how is the metadata storage of Parquet compared to other file formats? Uh, yes, that is a great question. Yes, how how does the metadata storage? compare. And I haven't gotten that far into that question yet. Um, I, I mean, I have, for example, worked for HDF5 for the Zwicky Transient Facility, our, our match files. And it's, and, and it's very easy to, to add attributes to that. And uh, for Parquet, I, I'm not sure. We're still looking into that. And so it's, yes, I, it's not clear to me yet how self-contained you can make it. And it, it might be that you need a file outside to to uh, describe the schema. Um, I could jump in a little bit on that one as well. I'm, I think I'm still uh, yeah, you're still here. here. Okay, good. Um, so uh, what we have done is actually we can uh, we have all the fits metadata inside Parquet as well, uh, and when we do subsets of uh, so that means subtubes uh, cutouts of out of these tubes. Uh, we are generating again fits uh, headers out of that uh, because people want to have fits uh, on out output as well. Um, so it's all in parquet um, and uh, and sitting there to to be processed. So it's actually processed alongside the the cutouts themselves as well. Okay. Any more questions? Now Perry can talk about ASDF. Um, yeah, I was, I, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I guess I don't want to uh, do my talk twice. Oh. So uh, I'll, I'll give a brief uh, synopsis. I mean, we developed this uh, for a number of reasons. And, and uh, it's basically just to give a very uh, quick overview. Uh, the idea is uh, all the metadata and structural organization is, is in YAML in a YAML header, and it, it allows for uh, an arbitrary number of uh, binary uh, blocks to be 
appended to the file. So it does handle uh, binary uh, very well, uh, unlike pure text uh, formats. And uh, the idea is to make it very flexible. It's not, it, and also not particularly uh, focused on astronomy. It just seems like uh, we need something that is pretty general. Uh, and it would be nice if other uh, domains found this useful as well. Um, the, uh, it supports uh, uh, versioning. Uh, it has uh, schemas and uh, the files can be validated against the schemas. Uh, we're continuing to add features to it. We would like to, uh, in the coming year, support uh, chunking and uh, uh, BLOSC type compression schemes. So uh, I, I invite people who are interested in looking at this uh, to go to the talk. I mean, we're using it extensively for JWST uh, and uh, for uh, W First Roman, as it's now called. And uh, we certainly would like to see others use it and we, we welcome uh, contributions and we also like to help other people uh, try it out and adopt it if possible. So uh, I'm happy to take questions or now or tomorrow or after tomorrow's talk. So, but that's the uh, a brief uh, description of what the format is about. Uh, one of the things that maybe I'll, I'll extend a little bit, which I don't talk too much about in the talk tomorrow is is that uh, one of the things it does is um, it enables uh, including uh, complex expressions of models uh, such that, uh, you know, this allows us to de develop very um, extensive and detailed models for WCS, but it's not just limited to WCS, but that was the main driver in our case because uh, uh, you know, HST, JWST, these space telescopes put very strong demands on accuracy of uh, distortion models. So uh, it's a very flexible uh, scheme for recording uh, models. You can you can uh, uh, chain them together. You can uh, increase the dimensionality of models. Uh, you can make, in effect, some parameters. Of uh, input coordinates so that if you know that something afterwards like uh, position in a slit, you can uh, refine the uh, WCS. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, functionality is, is embedded in that. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Perry. So his talk is tomorrow morning at, let's see what time it is. Um, well, it's at 12 UTC, I think. <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly at 12 UTC. So great. Um, that will, I'll be up for that to hear it. So yeah, I'll um, try to be up as well. <laughs> I hope so, yes. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions to anything? Any further discussion about data formats? Um, you can hang around if you people want to leave. Anybody that wants to continue can stay on for a while. We have this channel till, um, till uh, whatever 30. It will be another uh, half an hour, I think, right? Yeah, another half hour. So exactly half an hour. So, well, uh, so um, I was wondering about binary tables. So it's been about five years since I've been to one of these. And um, when I left, there basically was no alternative to fits binary tables. And I'm still pretty happy with the way they, they worked in this project this year. Um, but it sounded from, a, a, from things said today, but also from at least one other talk that there may be alternatives that are actually making progress. I mean, images are easy. They're just big binary arrays, but mm -hmm. binary tables have a lot of computer science behind them. So what are the, the, com the competing options these days? Uh, well, uh, while I'm not uh, muted, uh, as this supports binary tables, the only thing it doesn't support right now is uh, the uh, heap option on binary tables, but uh, all, all the other. Oh, oh, the heap option is something you definitely want. That's the whole gimmick behind compression. Um, but in the sense of, I mean, the, the advantage of FITS is it has survived for, for um, 40 years and more. And are there other 
competitors that one could, you know, use this year and not see obsolete in five years is kind of, let alone 40 years. I mean, I, I like the discussion about Parquet and I bet there are some other things going on, but the underlying binary format. So is Parquet compress ASCII or is it, yeah. So yeah, I guess the question is, ASCII is a, a, a pretty good archival format if you can figure out how to archivally compress it, which has been a discussion in the archival community for a long time. So, oops. Anyway. Sorry. Simon, you are unmuted. Um, I think also what I what I like about the Parquet and the Arrow ecosystem is that it's there's a lot of community community support and support from big corporations. Like I know NVIDIA's um, with their Rapids ecosystem, they're building GPU SQL servers and data frame, uh, you know, data frames. And I think they're working with Parquet as one of their formats. So um, I guess the hope is that one that that takes the maintenance burden, um, perhaps, of the astronomy community, or at least spreads it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things. I have like my reference point is the Harvard plate stacks, which I've worked on the digitization of, and they're 140 years old. And, um, wow. and, and we have data out of them. So plates turn out to be a pretty stable compared to anything we have right now, way of storing lots and lots and lots and lots of data. Um, and the other thing is that I've had my website for, um, 27 years now. And so I feel like anything, it's been stable for 27 years. I mean, things have changed gradually in it, but pretty much everything I've put up is still there. So I, I, that's my other standard for um, long livedness of, of things. And so I, I, get, I get pretty um, skeptical a lot. Um, well, the, the question is achieving a long lived form has an interesting, elaborated, reticulated binary format under it. So, I mean, the the other option that I use every day is SQL. So when I get right. off here, I'm going to be doing some SQL queries and things. It's not exactly a fit style. Here's something you'll be able to read in 40 years, considering the Minor Planet Center is transitioning from MariaDB, which is a, you know, a, a variation of of my SQL to Postgres. So, I mean, it's like the whole thing is up in the air. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you get I a little tired of, of remembering to use a single quote instead of double quotes and things like that. <laughs> well, yeah. So, it's, it's, so long termness is um, a challenge. And one of the things that sort of has scared me a little bit is I've gotten involved with a, there's a sort of, movement called maintainers. There's a maintainers um, email list and they actually have a staff person right now because they got a grant to keep going, but it, they discussed long-term maintenance of everything. I mean, and there's also another separate group called info maintainers which split off to talk about that. And they meet, have a, a discussion every, a Zoom discussion once a month. And I went to one of those to talk with them and they tend to be younger than me I was like the old person um, by a lot. And talking about what their time frame is for looking at maintenance of, of software, it's like five years. And I think that's really true if you look at what's going on in software right now, it seems to me like languages change on the scale of five years. And trying to preserve anything that's where the language, where the code is the, the format, or the code defines the format that you're stuck. I mean, Python has been around for a while, but not a really long while. And it and two to three broke a lot of stuff. So um, I just I worry about archivalness of things. Um, I tend to I tend to take 
a hundred year time scale about most things. So, um, well, I mean, the thing about an archive is it's a living format. So the asteroid community does pre recoveries on objects where you, you discover a new thing and you go back and look at sometimes glass plates to find uh, earlier epochs. And uh, both uh, the surveys in Arizona and Hawaii issue a lot of pre-coveries of, of objects that were discovered last night. And we found data going back weeks or years or decades ago occasionally. Right. So um, the way to look at an archive is as a living future That's document, true. not an not an obsolete document. No, I mean it there's I think some level of it has to be stable and other parts of it. I mean if you have stuff that's on a spinning disk you have to move it every once in a while just because you have to do that. And uh, and you have to be sure you don't lose things when you move it. But that seems to be the most stable storage method now. Um, DVDs and CDs are short term things. Magnetic tape is probably at least as long term as, as CDs and DVDs, as it turns out. Um, and that has its stability problems too. Um, etching things in glass is probably the safest thing to do. Um, but exposing but glass them, isn't very binary. No, it yeah, isn't. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Uh, glass plates are wonderful archival things if they're properly made, but you maintained, um, but they're very difficult to use directly. Right. And the archiving is a balancing act between maintaining and using. And so in, in the PDS, our data structures are hopefully very static because they are easy to maintain. I don't expect people to use PDS format as a processing format because it's not efficient. It is purposely not efficient. It's designed right. for preservation. So uh, the difference, the interface is made up in software. So if we have something that's digitally stable, we can move with changing tech because we know exactly what's in the archive and that's not changing. So when something new comes along, we can write that interface for the new system once and it should work for the whole archive. Mm -hmm. um, and we can continue to accrete things into the archive, which is how our archive lives. But the archive itself, does the, the structure that holds it, the, the definition for it, that does not change. And that also is maintained uh, as an abstract database, not as an implementation. So if, when XML goes away and is replaced by the next thing, we just need to write one output routine to express our data model in the new technology. And then translating, all we have to translate is the labels, not the actual data. So but, we can handle things with interfaces. That's, that's the goal of our archive to try to bridge that, that tension between preservation and service to the contemporary community. It, it's pretty trivial to translate XML to JSON, but one could hardly call JSON the new thing anymore either. So, whatever it ends up being, uh, yeah. the model exists in a protege database as an abstract thing. We already dump it in JSON automatically, and there's a couple of other formats that it can be dumped in depending on what you want to do with the model. Yeah, that's the trick is to have multiple outputs. Rosa, you had. Andreas uh, and Perry, do you want to talk? You have your hand raised. Uh, I just wanted to mention that ASDIF allows you <clears throat> to store tables and arrays either in text or binary. So those that uh, like it in text can can uh, save them that way. Uh, you know, for, for the most part, the software interface should support uh, that that by, you know that alternate representation uh, uh, transparently and. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be hard for us to add support for heap storage too. We just haven't had a, a strong need for it. We've been designed this to be fairly extensible, both at a standard level and for local uses. So um, it's and, and mechanisms for dealing with plugins and things like that. So I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, just, just a short one from myself. Um, so on, on the on the format side, I think um, you've mentioned already, um, Jessica and, and uh, uh, as well. So the, the, uh, 
the uh, the main issue right now is actually not the format is is the changing technology of storing the data longer term and there's no good long term solution for for data uh, of the size we are talking about right now at all it just doesn't exist um, and uh, even if you talk about tapes uh, it, it looks like they are stable but they are not because uh, uh, you have to to go with uh, the latest technology as well on on those, else you will run out of uh, support for even the drives. Right. <laughs> yeah. As well. So so uh, well, I as long as I'm doing archiving, and that's quite some some time, I think I've changed uh, uh, technology, and that means storage technology at least ten times. But I've never changed the format because we are still talking fits here. Yeah, my, my oldest data is from my thesis in 1974. And it's on punched cards. And there, I don't know where I could find a punch card reader right now. I suspect that someone's got a USB punch card reader, but I can scan them in a scanner and, um, and translate them. I'm pretty sure if, if nobody's written a program to do that, I could write one. So. Um, so they're still readable, but that's the only thing that I have that's that old. Although some of our data, I'm, I, we just are publishing an archive paper in AJ, and the data there is 25 years of data. So the oldest data is 26 years old now. Um, the next paper is going to go back another 10 years before that um, from another instrument, and it'll be like 30 years of data um, from an instrument that started in 1979. So. Um, I think those are all those are data that have been digital their whole lives and have been on I don't even know how many disk drives over over the years <laughs> they've been moved. This is one of these okay boomer discussions that comes up at yeah. ADAS quite regularly. Um, fo folks early in their career listening to this, you have to understand that it was just yesterday that uh, us old fogies were early <laughs> in our career. Um, once I wrote a Mark Sense reader, like, you know, bubble for, for voting lately in IRAF, a package for that in IRAF for an unrelated project. And, and what you described for reading a, a, um, a Hollerith card would be trivial. Um, it, the difficulty is, is moving the cards through rapidly <laughs> such that you're, you can finish a box in, in a day rather than a month, you know. Or if you have a sheet fed scanner, you might be able to pull that off. Maybe, maybe. Uh, one, oh, two oh, things. Thomas, um, I unmuted him. He wanted okay. to say something. Go, Thomas. Yeah. Yes, thanks for taking my call. Um, Andreas, I think you, you're touching on something very important. Um, the, the, the storage medium, the, the, the way of storing things should be totally independent of the content, right? That's what you're saying. It doesn't matter where I store my my the data I want to archive, right? If it's if it's a, on, a, on a on a stone plate or glass shard or piece of scotch film, it doesn't matter really, as long as I keep a reader around, right? For the medium, I think that's yeah. that's the cru that's the crucial point, and uh, that's that's indeed a problem. I mean, I have a SCSI uh, that. A tape reader still around, but I don't have a computer anymore that actually uh, I can use the dot tape reader with, right? Because there's no you know, no SCSI interface anymore around. So um, I think uh, separating the storage technology from from how we want to store things uh, um, is the first step. The second step is you you said that you're still using fits. So well, that is interesting. Why is FITS so appealing? Is it, its, guess, is yeah. it its simplicity? Yeah, well, but that's, that's one thing. But uh, when I'm saying I'm still using FITS, that's, that's more for, uh, out of uh, uh, pressure from uh, customers, so to speak, so the users at the end of the day rather than internally. So uh, on, on archive, we, we are not using FITS uh, anymore, mostly. And the, especially not when we do large scale processing, but then fit is, is more burden than anything else. Uh, but uh, on output and, and to, to uh, describe data, 
which is still uh, used because we have a, have a good standard there. Um, but uh, going back to your problem with, uh, so I guess one, one of the problems actually is, is also, uh, you don't want to do uh, constant format changes along with constant media changes. <laughs> so I guess it's a bit of laziness as well in, invol involved in that. So if you have to move data all the time from one medium to another one, just to, uh, to be able to still store the, all your data or make it actually uh, small enough that you can uh, gather more and more and more data. Uh, that's what happened at ESO, for instance. Um, then, uh, well, that's, that's uh, pretty much your occupation then, just uh, making sure that you can still move the data. You don't want to touch the data if you don't have to and, and reformat it or just do anything like that. Just copy it over and, and, and off you go. Do a few checksums and hopefully you're fine with that. Indeed. I mean, it sounds like that, that we're now chasing the latest technology every five years. Uh, now it's JSON. So all the archive data has to be converted into JSON. And then in five years time, all the data that we have archived until then has to be converted to, I don't know uh, what you want then, version 4.0. Right. Um, so the, the, the point of that, that uh, is made here that we need an, an archival format uh, that, that can survive a generation of people. Right. I think uh, it's very crucial, but I don't see how we actually can address the needs of the people, the generation after us. Well, because, uh, you know, they won't have the, the readers, they won't have the file formats that we have now. That is very likely. Well, think... they'll still have FITS, which is published in the professional literature and has such a huge market penetration that intervening generations of programmers will perhaps reluctantly feel the need to support it. So FITS it is. Yeah. For the next hundred years. Very simple. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we, just don't, we don't have experience with um, software that still works after more than like 60 years, 70 maybe. But yeah. um, it's just like working in the future is hard with software. I think, um, you know, you have to start looking at, archi I mean, I've gotten involved with archival, non-digital archival things or pre-digital maybe um, as well in the rest of my life. And I'm on an advisory committee for an archive, for example. And it, it's really interesting to look at how paper archives have been preserved or being preserved and um, or have been preserved for a long time. And uh, looking back to the beginning of um, printed media as opposed to um, written media is an interesting thing to do too, to look at to get perspective. I went to a talk yesterday on 15th century type fonts. So I was escaping from looking at the future into looking at the past. But the point is the stuff this guy printed who invented basically what we think of as Roman type, um, he invented the lowercase part of it. it, it we can still read it. <laughs> so um, I think the question is what can we do that is still going to be readable in 500 years, and uh, or yeah, which this is. This is actually 530 years old. So you know, what can we do um, that will? And will it be? Who will it be worthwhile for? Um, the oldest data that I've actually used to do science with were 1912 um, radio velocity plots from somebody that measured them on a. Um, by, by uh, visually looking at the spectrogram. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to see what you can get. Um, so there we are. Um, and they were useful for tightening down a, a period of a binary. So, so hey, Jessica, um, one thing yeah. that has been that people are talking about in this court is about compression. I know that that's something that came up last ADAS. Yeah. Um, we yeah, the, that. yeah, the question has been, um, how can you, there are a lot of different, even within FITS, there are a lot of compression algorithms that are used. 
And there often is only one implementation um, of that an individual thing that's very hard to duplicate from the description of it. So the question is over time, if how well can you describe your compression method so that people can write decompressors who didn't write the compression? Uh, well, I, I hope Bill's gonna talk about compression, but um, FITS tile compression is supported by um, not just CFITS IO, but other, other uh, utilities. Um, and the underlying default rice compression is something that could be written down in three pages of C code, even including the FITS part of it, you know, the shuffle the bytes around part of it. Um, and, which I know because I, I did that. Um, I did the initial implementation and Bill actually made it practical to the community. Um, the, the, as far as compression, let, let, me, let me give an example. So PDS is not particularly interested in compressed data. We are delivering compressed images because our images are already compressed. And if PSI wants to uncompress them, that's perfectly fine by us. Our older data, Catalina's older data before I arrived was um, H compress. So it was Rick White's H compress. And uh, before I arrived, they actually transitioned, my group transitioned to FPAC, the current tile compression format. And uh, uh, Bill Pence and Rick White and I came up with a way of taking H compress uh, blobs of binary information and converting them into FPAC format without changing anything, because I don't want to have to uncompress and recompress everything just for it to be uncompressed again. And that's what will be done to pass the legacy Catalina data onto the PDS. And then if they decompress it, that's A-OK -okay by us. But um, there are ways to handle compressed data that handle it like data, not like an opaque binary object that is unintelligible of future generations. The definition still exists. And computers are good at this sort of stuff. And for that matter, there's nothing magical about, about two's complement integers or IEEE floating point. Those are also ways of obscuring the underlying numerical nature of our data, just like ASCII is or Unicode. There's another example, ASCII has evolved into Unicode, but remain backwards compatible. Okay, um, any more questions? <laughs> Keep doing but this. Yeah, I still get the same, so the same response from ADAS. Okay, that's that's good, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Perry has his hand raised still. Is that a remnant or do you have more to say? No, I I, I just want to make a couple comments about archive, um, archivability. Uh, I have a hard time believing JSON won't, or and, and YAML to a lesser extent won't be supported for a long time. It's very, very simple. <laughs> and arguably a lot simpler than the FITS equivalent. And um, and so that I I have trouble believing is, is gonna be a, a long-term issue. As far as compression goes, well, you know, there's a, there's a judgment call there. If you really want uh, uh, the data in the archive to be easily interpreted in the future, you have to be careful about what compression you use and, and how you do things. Um, you know, it, the compression is obviously important for uh, processing the data and, and short-term use. It may not be suitable for long-term archival use. And so that's something people always have to keep in mind. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, PDS has a couple of scars from accepting compressed data in the past. Fortunately, for the most part, our data volumes are such that even when they get large, we can send the uncompressed version to our deep archive and serve a compressed version so that we have the safety copy just in case. 
And if you wait five years, the volume isn't problematic anymore. The first data set I ever worked on in the PDS so that I can join the old timers reminiscing was the International Halley Watch, which consisted of 24 CDs, 19 of which contained what became problematically compressed image data. And it was considered a huge data set at the time. It is in fact uncompressed about 64 gigabytes. It fits on a $2 thumb drive now. So it became not problematic about five years after we originally archived it. And we have the same issue now with the sky surveys that we're bringing in. Two or three petabytes over the next five years, that's going to be annoying for about five years. Five years from now, I suspect we'll be, we'll be buying petabyte drives and more migrating onto new drives. It's just the way things seem to work. It's, it's the way things have been for the 30 years that I've worked for the small bodies node. I expect it to continue. A petabyte is about, I don't know, four super micro chassis now with a couple of dozen helium drives in each uh, yeah. and is 50,000 bucks or something. Yeah, I know. We have to buy like four of them <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to accommodate the sky surveys we're bringing in. And like I said, so right now we have to adjust our budget because the small bodies node for most of its career lived comfortably with data sets that were well within cheap storage specs. This is not, this is expensive storage specs, but there's no problem finding it. We don't have the issues that EOS has with, oh my God, how are we gonna store an exabyte of data? That's not our problem. The problem is we just need enough money to buy it and someplace to stick it. And 10 years from now, we'll be going, why were we worrying about five petabytes of data? So. Hi, that's why you were worrying about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you need to record it while it's there and not you don't have any place to put it until they get the well, five Yeah, and our service copy will be compressed because the deep archival copy will be in a, at NSSDCA. We've talked to them, they'll take it uncompressed, it's great. So if we have to go back to the original for any reason, we've got it. But as Rob said, we're getting it in a compressed format. The first thing we do is verify the upload, then we decompress it and verify that. And then we set that aside for the NSSDCA but nobody wants to transfer large quantities of data in their uncompressed format either if the compression routines are readily available now. So uh, part of our service to the community now is to deal with the format that is reasonable. A, a point of order that our original compression was lossy and you ought to retain the original compressed version and not decompress and recompress. Yeah, in fact, that's what we do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, it is one minute to 930 when we nominally end. And um, I don't know what the rules are since nothing else is happening for two and a half hours. Um, the discussion has been slowing, but it's been going on. So I don't know, we are down to only 95 participants. So we, we haven't really lost a lot of people. Um, you can leave if you're not finding it interesting and nobody will penalize you. Um, we need to put together the, the people that have presented and everybody has to write up a couple paragraphs for our paper. Um, we'll have a summary, right, Rosie? <laughs> um, I think we'll have a summary that, that we can put together. I'll try to write from memory what I do. The slides will be online wherever they are supposed to be. I'll, I'll check into exactly that. I haven't. They just got created. Um, I think I finished creating them this morning. So um, all the submissions came in yesterday. So we're, we're, we're running on a little tight schedule here. And I didn't even know who the co-authors would be until yesterday. Um, so uh, we will be moving ahead. But the whole thing and all the links are going to be linkable from the PDF file, that everything that we put up. And there's also a, but there are a number of links in the um, Discord, which is going to be, as I understand it, up indefinitely. So if you ever need to look into a discussion of, of archiving, archival formats, go to Discord and see what people say if you haven't already been there, which I suspect most people have been. Um, it's pretty enlightening. And uh, um, I haven't been contributing much because I've been trying to keep track of what's going on. And I'm not, I'm old and I have not as many focal points as a young person does. 
So anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, if there's anybody who wants to say anything at the end, I think we've sort of summed it up. Um, it is generally seems to be true that the presenters here have been of a certain age. Um, and there's a reason for that when you talk about archives, because when you get to be a certain age, you start thinking about legacies and whether the stuff you've done in your life or you've used from other people in your life will still be available to the next generation. And we want to make sure it is. And I think the people that start off with FITS, all they really wanted to do is move the data around in, in semi real time. And uh, so it's really a, a transport format as much as an archive, it became an archival format later. And well, it, it, it's still a transport format. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the astronomical science cases are about multiple institutions cooperating on some right. project like the LIGO optical follow-up, et cetera. And right. they need to speak a lingua franca. Right. And um, if it's not fits, fine, suggest something else, but you also have to make the case of why not fits. What is it that's beneficial that you're getting instead of fits or XML or JSON or whatever SQL. Yeah. And, what you find, and what you find out is having a standard that's really accessible helps a lot. And so we're hoping, like ASDF looks like it's moving forward, a well-defined standard, um, PDS4, has a lot of metadata to standardize. Um, I think what we're, I think that's the goal because we find out first that the met, first that the data needs to be in standard standard format or a one of a bunch of standard formats, and then we have to figure out how we define all the metadata. And Fitz has been pretty good about defining metadata. Um, people are not perfect about it, but what I like to do is so in our archive paper for AJ. One of the appendices is the definition of all the keywords we use. And um, it was accepted. So that's what we're doing. And I'd like to see more people do that. So you can look at their data and uh, find out what it means. So we're putting it into refereed literature. So it's going to be there for hopefully a long time. I, I can mention that uh, the weather finally cleared last night and we were back on the sky. And there were not one, but two asteroids discovered coming closer than the moon, larger than Chelyabinsk last night from Ooh. Arizona and Hawaii. And that's something of a typical night. There's a big difference I, between be, be coming, coming half the distance to the moon and coming inside the geosynchronous satellite belt. But that happens quite frequently, too. Yeah. So, um, you know, things have requirements that are you know, moment by moment and things have requirements that go over 40 years. Yeah. And some of those things as they get thicker, you're going to want to look back and see in the older data whether it shows up. Right, exactly. So if and you know that are, the orbit came to be near the Earth before. You can... yeah, um, so. Well, if it comes near the Earth, it, it not, has come near the Earth's orbit before. And even if it gets bent by the Earth's orbit, the constraint is the minimum orbit distance remains the same after it gets gravitationally slung around the Earth. So you can't get away from the things. OK. So we want to close off right now. And um, I, just as a point of interest, I, I would mention something. It, so when I first started working with astronomical data 35 years ago at Goddard Space Flight Center, FITS was a thing because the primary problem was having a common way to describe a data format, a common data format so that the, you could just read the damn bytes. And this was when there wasn't a fixed size for bytes, when there wasn't an IEEE floating point standard, and it was just hardware was being designed for the efficiency of the customer that they were trying to sell it to. And so there was very little standardization. It was happening quickly, but it didn't exist at the time. Now, that's not really a thing anymore. Just about everybody is using IEEE until you get into esoteric hardware. It's very common to find that supported. Integers have settled down to two's complement. Byte order is still a thing, but it's only one 
variable, so it's relatively easy to manage. Now the variability and the lack of standardization is in the metadata and metadata has become more important. And the principal conflict that I see between different formats that arise is the fact that the metadata definition is different and appropriate to whatever the particular application is. And that's true for PDS4 as well. Um, we designed our metadata to be exhaustively descriptive in discipline terms, not knowing what the future use would be. I don't know if it's gonna be as easy to standardize on metadata as it is for data structural descriptions, but that's kind of the way conversations seem to be running now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we don't talk about with FITS so much is in fact, FITS has a lot of predefined metadata and that's all the basic stuff is predefined. And um, that is more than format. And I yeah, I'm not that, sure I would describe that as a lot, but I've seen the PDS4 information model. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, okay, let's not say, but, but it has grown over time how much meta, and we have conventions which define more metadata. So they're formally defined, even though they're not necessarily quite standard. So there's standards and there's formally defined conventions. And I think that as other formats move forward, they need to be aware of that as well. So, um, and that's what we discuss here, um, formats and metadata. I should make that clearer next year. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, and hearing none, Discord's quieted down. Nobody has a hand raised. So I will declare at 9.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, because that's what all my clocks say, that we are adjourned. And I will close the session. We Don't stop. we have one of those applause things that people do? Oh, we can Good do job. that. Yeah. yeah. Do that. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Bye. Thanks, for everybody, for coming.